Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Hereford, and my co-host Peter Glassford is unfortunately not with me this week. However, we have a super exciting guest, and since she's talking about women's stuff, I guess it makes sense that I'm the one introducing it. Uh, Laura Powers is one of the coolest people I've ever met. Uh, She lives up in Collingwood, Ontario, and we met her because Peter works at the same gym as her, uh, Active Life. Uh, So, one of the most frequently ignored muscles in the body is the pelvic floor. Uh, It's hard to work out, it's impossible to see, and until you actually have a problem, it can be difficult to comprehend the importance of taking care of it. So, to find out why it's so important and what you can do to keep your pelvic floor in tip-top shape, I talked with Laura Powers, who is a physiotherapist living in Collingwood. She's been focused on helping women, primarily athletes, correct their pelvic floors for the past few years and considers educating the public on the topic to be one of her primary passions. So today's podcast is super exciting. We get into so many topics that I feel like very rarely get talked about, um, especially, you know, not in public. Sometimes it's more stuff you, you maybe chat about with a couple of really close friends, but you're just not really discussing with people who, you know, might have some expertise in the subject. Uh, really interesting new field of study. I'm so excited that she was on to share some of her thoughts, and I think she's just awesome, and it's a really fun one to listen to because she's hilarious, too. So without further ado, I'll give you Laura Powers. Enjoy the podcast, and let us know if you have any comments or questions about pelvic floors. My name's Laura Powers, and I'm a registered physiotherapist up in Collingwood, Ontario. Um, I have my own private business, which is called Higher Function Physiotherapy, uh, where I only do pelvic floor physiotherapy for women. And then I also work at Active Life Conditioning, um, where I do more orthopedic physiotherapy, do some conditioning training for groups, as well as personal training, exercise rehab, um, and work with a variety of of age groups um, and gender. Um, So it's a really good, diverse sort of uh, demographic that I get to work with that kind of keeps me on my toes and uh, allows me some variety and some excitement in what I do. So I started um, practicing physio about six years ago now, which is crazy. (laughs) And um, (laughs) I don't even know where time has gone. And um, right from the get-go, I always had an interest in pelvic floor physiotherapy. <clears throat> I did a placement when I was in Australia where I studied my physio, and um, I got to work in a women's hospital where I was um, on the pre- and postnatal wards, and we did a lot of education right like three days postpartum, which was amazing, something we don't have here. Um, and it really just kind of piqued my interest in how we can help women and how, how much these sort of symptoms can affect day-to-day life. Like we're going to talk about how it relates specifically kind of more to athletics, but in the grand scheme of things, it really does affect, um, day-to-day life, your self-esteem, your social abilities, your confidence, um, what you enjoy doing. So it's, um, it really kind of hit me of how much we can help women and how this is really underserviced, um, within the public floor physiotherapy realm of it. Um, so yeah, and then I just started taking courses and started expanding my knowledge and then opened up, as I said, my own practice, the higher function, um, physiotherapy about a year and a half ago, and it's going really well and just trying to grow it and spread the word of, you know, um, what help there is for women that have these issues. So yeah. Awesome. So how was it sort of, I mean, I deal with this too, whenever I do my, my lady parts talks, but how was it Mm -hmm. sort of dealing with that initial, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to talk about lady parts as a job. (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah, I think, one, I've kind of always been fairly comfortable with my body and talking about it. So personally, I had a certain level of comfort. But, you know, it's kind of, it, it becomes the sort of medical part of it. And you have to discuss it. And you have to be comfortable with it to make your patients comfortable. So I really had had no choice really but to get comfortable <laughs> with it. And I think, you know, the more we are comfortable about it and we can use those words, vagina, rectum, anus, all that stuff, you know, that makes most people shy away, it, it'll just become more common 
conversation. And that's the biggest thing that I find that, you know, if women could be more comfortable talking about it, we'd be able to spread this word more and um, people would become more aware of it, how it can help. So, you know, I think it was definitely a bit of a challenge and I still struggle sometimes, you know, I kind of catch myself and, but I've just, I've found that the more comfortable I am, the more comfortable my patients are to open up and talk about it. Cause like I say to them, we're going to talk about everything and Mm -hmm. like (laughs) we're going to talk about pee and poop and all your parts and stuff like that and um and then they just seem to open up way more so I kind of force myself (laughs) yeah yeah for sure I've definitely noticed that during my talks like the the longer I go on about stuff and start yeah yeah forcing it then people people get used to it and it's it's a Mm -hmm. process but yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's let's dive in then. What are some okay. of the most common pelvic floor issues that you see in female athletes in general? Yeah, in general, I mean, I guess it is really dependent on their sport that they do, mm-hmm. but any sport that involves sort of impact um, or heavy lifting or bracing. So say running, um, gymnastics, CrossFit, anything where there's that really dynamic um exercises, you know, the main things that I'm going to see is um, stress urinary incontinence. So that's involuntary um, leakage of urine Mm -hmm. um, under pressure. So when you jump, you have some leakage. When you run, you have some leakage. Heavy lifting, you know, you have some leakage, box jumps, burpees, all that stuff. Um, So that's probably number one. Um, What often goes with that would be prolapse. So um, women will describe that as like heaviness vaginally or pressure, just some sort of sensation down below. That's not pain. It's just more discomfort. Um, And again, that's sort of more associated with the weakening of the vaginal wall or of the prolapse. So that stress urinary incontinence and prolapse can go hand in hand, or they might not have either symptoms with the other. Um, But that's definitely more with those impact um, sort of um, activities. And just, you know, one in four women actually have some sort of urinary incontinence. So if we take athletes, we can kind of expect sort of the same thing with that too. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then cyclists in particular Mm -hmm. was my other question. Yeah. So the thing with cyclists is obviously it's a low impact. Um, There's no jumping. So the stress urinary incontinence is very low unless they have it with some sort of underlying training or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But the main thing you see with them is some sort of, or could see, sorry, I should say is pelvic pain, numbness, sexual dysfunction, like they just can't get orgasms Mm -hmm. like they used to since they started cycling, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it's mostly due to that compression, that prolonged compression onto the saddle. Um, You have all your nerves that innervate your pelvic floor, the veins and arteries that sort of circulate the blood through. And when that gets compressed, it can create different sensations into the saddle area. And that's, that's more likely what we'll see is either like deep inside pelvic pain, numbness, sort of just superficially, um, or again, that sexual dysfunction. So, yeah. Okay. That sounds fun. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So, I mean, obviously that stuff is all kind of, you know, red light is flashing like, ah, seek help. But are there any Mm -hmm. kind of early warning signs that a woman could kind of be paying attention to as an athlete for when she should start thinking, oh, my pelvic floor could use some work? Yeah. I mean, (laughs) Definitely as a woman or a female athlete that's had babies, you should be doing pelvic floor exercises or seeking some sort of like preventative treatment because childbirth is a fairly um, high risk factor, obviously, Mm -hmm. for pelvic floor dysfunction. So if you've had kids and you are an athlete, you know, I would advocate you should probably seek some sort of um, guidance anyways. Um, What I tend to see is that you know, in terms of early signs, basically all your symptoms that I just described will start off as infrequent or small amounts. Okay. If it goes, yeah, if it goes sort of unaddressed, it just gets worse. So you'll have more leakage. It'll happen earlier in your workout. Your pain will become longer and more intense. So, you know, any of those signs are or or those symptoms are signs that, you know, something isn't quite right. Even just a little bit of leakage is not normal, you know, or a little bit of tingling. Yeah, that's, I guess I should say tingling or some discomfort on the saddle is somewhat normal, but there's things that you can do to prevent it from getting worse, right? So any of that stuff is, 
is sort of warning signs. And if unaddressed, it'll just get worse potentially. So especially if you're training ups, like you start lifting more, you start riding longer, you know, the expectation, it, it could potentially get worse. So yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. And then so if someone does say, okay, I think I, you know, should see someone even as preventative measures, what certifications are they looking at? What are they looking yeah. for? Because until I met you, I honestly had no idea that there was someone that could help me with yeah. my pelvic floor. Yeah, yeah. And that's pretty common to hear people like, I had no idea this even existed, which, mm-hmm. again, you know, trying to advertise and advocate and get it out there. Um, so there's lots of physios that um, kind of claim to treat pelvic floor and it'll all be external work. So they'll talk about how to, you know, do Kegels and they'll educate on positioning and how to engage your core, which is all fabulous work um, and still greatly needed. Um, The difference with the type of work that I do is we do internal exams. I guess I should have said that from the get-go of what pelvic floor physio is. It's internal assessment. So with internal palpation of your pelvic floor muscles, Mm -hmm. um, as well as assessing externally and obviously with your consent and stuff like that, you know, so we always can do external assessments, but um, that's the biggest difference with it. And we in Ontario have to be registered by our college to perform these acts. So when looking for a physiotherapist, and I mean, I can only really use Ontario and Canada, all of the colleges will have a website and typically it'll say find a physio um, and it will specify what activities that we are um, able to perform. Okay. And if it doesn't say, you know, um, registered to do internal palpation, then, you know, it's just someone that is going to educate and talk about how to engage um, and maybe external palpation. But the most effective way and research shows it is through internal palpation um, to truly kind of assess where your pelvic floor muscles are, how to tr- properly you know, guide your treatment um, and to give you the most amount of feedback and effective feedback. Because I see it all the time. Women come in and I'm like, yeah, I'm doing my Kegels. And then I feel it and I'm like, oh, I don't really <laughs> feel anything. And they're just holding the breath or sucking their tummy in or squeezing their glutes. And, you know, if you just continue to do it, it seems like you're doing something, but you're really not helping the cause. So. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, with an external uh, examination, what, like, can you actually tell anything? Because I'm like, if I touch yeah. my stomach, it's just muscle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, the other part to the assessment that, we're trying, and this comes back to, I'll answer your question and we'll come back to it. Um, (laughs) One of the things that we're also trying to assess with your pelvic floor is the muscle tension or tone um, or tightness of the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. So there's a normal resting tone of muscle that's considered healthy that will allow good contraction and relaxation. Um, In a weak pelvic floor, typically there's low tone. So there's the muscles feel kind of softer. There's not as much um, spring to the muscles versus a high tone pelvic floor, which feels very tight and restricted. Um, And low tone um, or a weak pelvic floor is going to be with that stress urinary incontinence or prolapse. Um, And then typically um, when there's pelvic pain or numbness, some sort of irritation, it's typically um, a tighter pelvic floor or restricted pelvic floor. And those require very different treatments. Um, So that's the piece that we end up missing with um, the external treatment. So what we feel with that is basically, can you make a contraction happen? So I, I mm-hmm. palpate sort of just inside to your sit bones. It's still, you know, within the external vaginal area. So it's still, you know, touching your parts, but it's not internal mm-hmm. and you can do it with closed on as well. So that's the other difference. Um, so I get a sense of, you know, is there a lift and is there a contraction happening in that area? I can't specify where exactly it's coming from or if, you know, um, what that muscle tension or tone feels like. Um, But, you know, taking in the person's story, taking in maybe do they have general tightness elsewhere? You know, is their breathing patterns funny? Stuff like that. We can kind of piece together an idea of what the pelvic floor might be like, but it's just not as specific. Gotcha. That makes sense. And then 
what uh so someone's coming to you what are some of the Mm -hmm. things you sort of wish that they knew before going in or how do they kind of get more comfortable with the idea Mm -hmm. that it's going to be internal because i imagine that's got to freak people out a little bit at the onset yeah yeah so i often you know people i say it's an internal exam sort of like when you go for a physical but the thing that i'm starting to realize is women when they visualize i'm going for a physical with like the doctor they picture that speculum and yep Uh. spreading (laughs) apart right and like looking inside and stuff and so what I try and explain is that you're going to feel some interesting sensations it's going to feel like pressure inside but it's most women say oh that wasn't as bad as I thought you know um and I kind of sit to the side so I'm not like staring I do observe (laughs) I do observe we need to look at tissue quality and make sure all the skin is healthy and look for scars and stuff like that but Mm -hmm. you know in terms of the treatment it's not quite as invasive and you know it's a really comfortable setting so most of the time you know people come in a little apprehensive and nervous about the internal part of it but you know in the end they often say oh that wasn't as bad as I thought so um and it's their own comfort and I really you know try to make them as comfortable and make them feel like they are in complete control of it so they can say "Mm, stop I'm not comfortable at any point you know so yeah yeah. I think that makes sense it's funny I actually just talked to a a male doctor about like guy saddle issues for cycling mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and he was saying uh, he thinks women tend to go to the doctor with like saddle sores and stuff more because we're so like from the age of what like 16 we're used to like our yearly kind of exactly. appointment where it's yeah yep, there's that speculum so yeah really yep. like this is pretty minimal compared to that <laughs> exactly and usually you know if women have had babies they're kind of like well everybody's seen it already so <laughs> It's not as bad. So that definitely. But, you know, I, I mean, I just assessed a woman yesterday and she was very nervous. Mm-hmm. She's like, let's just get this over with. And in the end, she did say, she's like, okay, that wasn't as bad as I thought, you know. So, you know, it, it, it's pretty common for the people to say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about what this is all going to entail. Because it is. It's not something. They think they're coming for physiotherapy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not your normal or typical um, sort of physio yeah. session. So, yeah. 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 I think, uh, you know, having seen you, you know, working with clients at the gym, not doing that, but otherwise, mm-hmm. I think you have a good kind of manner with people that makes them feel a lot more at ease. So, well, and that's the thing. If you like, we go back about talking about it, if you're really nervous and kind of like, yeah, they're going to feel that, they're going to pick up on it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, you kind of just make it light and casual and, you know, you talk throughout it, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, try and make them as comfortable as possible. So <laughs> that makes yeah. sense. All right. So when when a woman is done with the the session with you, do you leave her with like a list of exercises to do, or what's sort mm-hmm. of the outcome? Yeah. So I um one of my big sort of principles of my practice is home exercises. Because mm-hmm. um, as I describe to people, I'm like, I only see you maybe an hour once a week. What are you doing the rest of those days, rest of those hours throughout your day? Um, so I really emphasize um, the importance of home exercises and um, and that need to maintain the work that we do together. So if it is sort of, say, for a cyclist that does have pelvic pain or numbness, you know, I give lots of stretches, um, like child's pose, um, knees to chest, deep breathing, anything to create relaxation. You know, if it's a strengthening issue, um, research is showing you need to be doing those Kegels three times a day. Um, And we vary those repetitions based on the person's ability. But, you know, that's a goal to work up to. And if you're not going to be able to commit to that sort of time, then, you know, your progress or the strength is going to not improve. So it's just like any other training program. um, And that's sometimes a hard thing to um, get across to people because they're just like any other muscles of the body. Um, So they need that training effect. They need to be pushed if we're looking to strengthen the muscles. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you had tight neck muscles, you have to be going for like regular massages and doing your stretches and, you know, um, to help maintain that. So it's just like any other part. So I really do emphasize home exercise people um, and give them um, direction of, you know, modifications and and ways to make their day-to-day life because that's usually what's um, perpetuating it. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about kegels in a second, but this has made me think about it. So 
if you if you fix up your pelvic floor and your pelvic floor is in like tip top shape, how does that help your sex life? These are the important questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, they do find that increased contractility, so your ability to contract your pelvic floor and relax your pelvic floor, does help with sexual function and achieving orgasm. So Woo-hoo. if you have a Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there is that added benefit. Um, so, and again, I'm talking about females. There's a little bit varying um, information. Well, I shouldn't say we can help with some sexual function in men. Um, but if it's like true nerve damage and there just is no uh, kind of filling mm-hmm. um, of the penis, then we can't really help it. So if it's more just like, how do I contract my muscles? How do I get them stronger to create that tension? Um, It can help with sort of sexual pleasure. Um, So there is some, you know, additional benefit to just being able to work out and enjoy your exercise. Um, So, yeah, I mean, sometimes we talk about that. Um, The opposite spectrum, again, there's always a spectrum of like tight versus weak kind of thing. So for women that have really tight pelvic floors, so say someone with saddle pain when they ride, they might also have pain with intercourse. So, you know, obviously pain is not going to make intercourse pleasurable. And often I find women just abstain from it, which is really sad. Yeah. Um, It really like, and I, one of my favorite areas to work with, with women, because, you know, it brings so much joy (laughs) and, um, and it is something that we can improve. Um, with gentle stretching and relaxation and, you know, learning to let go of your pelvic floor because that's often what's happening is it's just so tight that when you get penetration, there's pain Mm -hmm. Um, or fear or, you know, then we get into lots of emotional stuff too. So um, it's, uh, again, it's always that spectrum. So if it was, you know, someone that has low tone, either they've just had a baby or they have stress incontinence and the pelvic floor is really weak, um, you know, strengthening it can help that sense of pleasure. You mm-hmm. get more sensation. And if it's pain, you know, we learn to let go and relax and, and then you don't have that pain aspect so you can enjoy sex more. So, yeah, it's Perfect. an interesting, an interesting element to what we deal with as well. So. Yeah. Good question. I like that one. Yeah. I like that one too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let's get back to Kegels. How do you know if you're doing a Kegel right? <laughs> Yeah. So, um, you often don't (laughs) sometimes, like I said, you know, I, I get a mix and I never, when people tell me that they're doing their Kegels every day, I'm kind of like, all right, well just let's wait and see and, and see what's going on here first before I confirm if they are. Um, the main thing that you want to get with the Kegel is that there's this general tension and lifting inside. It's a lift that's kind of more important. I'll often feel women tighten, but there's no lift that happens. And it's that lift that's really going to create that support to your pelvic floor um, and create that sort of spring Mm -hmm. that we need. Um, So can you hear that echo? Uh, No, you're actually good. No. Okay. I have this crazy echo. Sorry. We're going to have to probably go back. (laughs) Sorry. I'm hearing myself in double time and I'm like, that's so okay. I didn't know if you could hear it either. <laughs> no, you're Sorry. good. No worries. Okay. Okay. Uh, so how, so you, how do you know if you're doing a Kegel properly? Basically we want to feel that uh, a sense of tension in the pelvic floor and we want to feel a sensation of lift. So how I describe it to people is your pelvis is this bowl and a sling of muscles that go from your pubic bone to your tailbone to your sit bone. And we want to feel as if we're going to take that sling of muscles and draw it up inside. Now, the challenge is that you're not contracting your glutes, that you're not breath holding, that you're not just sucking in your tummy as you do it. Um, So it's the isolation that can become quite challenging for people. Um, And then obviously the, the strength of the contraction and the endurance of the contraction. So, I'll get people, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm squeezing. And I'll feel the initial tension and lift, but then it dies off. And they don't get the sense that it's died off. Until I say, oh, you got to come back on. You got to give me a little bit more. And then they're like, oh, okay. So there's just that our body's ability to not really have a great sense of that that area, of what it feels like. Um, Physiologically, they don't have the same receptors to say where it is in space. So, you know, it's a kind of open area to begin with. 
Um, and, and so giving that internal feedback of me tapping or pushing on a muscle, it gives more information to the brain to say where it is and, you know, to lift up into the space, to give it a sense of like area and direction and, and space. Um, so the internal part will really help to, to validate how you're contracting. Um, but the main thing, like I said, what we want to look for is that there is this sort of drawing up and in inward sensation that the glutes aren't engaging and her thighs aren't, you know, bracing and squeezing and shaking and breath isn't being held and tummy pulled in. Mm-hmm. Um, and the really sort of simple sort of directions that I give people is, you know, it should be a sensation as if you're going to stop passing gas. So if you want to kind of focus the back area, it's like, you know, the sensation you're going to hold in passing gas in a crowded room. So <laughs> <laughs> usually when I say that, they're like, oh, okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Right. So you don't want to let it, that's part of, you know, sometimes again, are you contracting it properly, but that's the general area and the sensation, you know, vaginally what we want to feel is like either during intercourse, you know, creating sort of a squeeze or if holding in a tampon, um, or drawing up and in in that area. And then through the front, through around the urethra, we want to think about as if you were going to stop midstream pee. So that just gives women a bit of a, a guide of those the different areas of the pelvic floor and can help with awareness um, of those different areas and how to contract. Um, but what we want to progress to is a more sort of um, sort of global contraction of all the muscles sort of working together to create that support. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a good starting point of, you know, am I doing this properly? Um, and I often get people, women to do a midstream urine stop test. One's off, don't do it repeated, but just, you know, it gives you a very, very, uh, generalized idea of is your pelvic floor strong or not? And can you make that urine stop? Um, that's not necessarily going to translate into a 10 K run or, um, uh, you know, 50 box jumps because there's a, an endurance component to it, but it gives you an idea. Is there some strength to my pelvic floor um, to work with? So, right. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. All right. So let's, let's skip to pregnancy. Uh, which mm-hmm. is a thing that I don't want to skip to personally at the moment, but <laughs> so we're skipping yeah. there. Um, how do you know how and when to train without risking damage of the pelvic floor? Is there any kind of yep. good rule of thumb? Yep. Um, so a lot of information just on general exercise for the pregnant mom comes um, from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. So they set out some guidelines on exercise in general. So they outline contraindications to exercise, you know, warning signs of, you know, maybe you need to tone it down or maybe exercise isn't safe um, and um, some safe exercises to be doing. Um, The other big thing is, you know, you need to have clearance by your family doctor or your obstetrician to make sure it's safe for you to be doing exercise, regardless of your, if you're a high um, caliber athlete and stuff like that. I think it is still important just to make sure that you and baby are safe, that, Mm -hmm. you know, you have some sort of physical before you, um, either continue with your training program or start your training program. Sure. So, you know, if you, the main thing is like, if you have in terms of damaging your pelvic floor, if you have any dysfunction, whether it be pain, stress, incontinence, urgency, frequency leading up to your pregnancy, um, you should be extra cautious and have some guidance um, during this pregnancy if you want to continue your exercise. Um, you know, there's are it's an indication that there's already potential um, uh, risk factors for further damaging or stressing your pelvic floor. Because mm-hmm. um, as the baby grows, it's going to change your posture. It's going to change your breathing patterns. It's going to change the stress down onto your pelvic floor. You know, the pelvic floor becomes um, like has more of a demand at that point as the baby keeps growing. So, you know, general rule of thumb, as you continue to get bigger, your exercise should become lower intensity. Um, if we're talking um, more like the running, jumping, um, lifting, that sort of thing. Right. Um, in terms of a cyclist, we need to consider the risk of falls. Right. Um, and the change of your balance with as your tummy grows. So, you know, there's, you know, th- up to three months, you're usually pretty safe. Um, but, you know, as your tummy starts growing and your center of mass starts changing and the risk of falling could, you know, harm the baby more, you need to really um, 
go to that lower intensity, um, less risking um, exercises. So, you know, I strongly encourage women um, to continue walking, hiking, running up to a certain point, um, strength training. You can definitely keep lifting weights and research is showing that, you know, there's minimal risk um, to the baby and the mother um, with exercise training, mm-hmm. um, which is great. Um, and it does often help um, delivery as well. The more fit you are, um, often the better labor you're going to have as well, too. So. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of damaging the pelvic floor, again, your body will also tell you, you know, so either you're going to start feeling more heaviness or pressure if you are doing sort of more impact exercises like jumping and running and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, or you might start experiencing pain and it's an indication, not that you necessarily have to stop all exercise. Sometimes the pain does make make women have to, um, but it's a sign that, okay, my body is not strong enough right now, or it's working too hard to try and do this. Um, or there's some sort of imbalance that is being heightened because of the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, it's just, I've, I've had a few women where they've come in, they've had pain. We do some either balancing exercise, like a rebalancing, I should say of the pelvis, strengthening exercises, core strengthening, hip strengthening, kegels, um, and, and their pain, um, improved and they're able to get back to their activity. So, you know, it's, everybody's different in terms of sort of the pain aspect, but in terms of the strengthening and, you know, stress to the pelvic floor, if you're getting stress incontinence or pressure of, you know, vaginally, it's usually a sign that you got to tone that exercise down a little bit um, or start some more strengthening um, to carry you through. So, you know, there's, everybody's a little bit different, especially if we're talking non-athlete to athlete. So if you, become pregnant and decide that you want to start training, you're going to have a much slower progression. If you're already a high caliber athlete with lots of training under your belt, then, you know, that progression and changes will be a little bit different. Um, The main thing too, that I I've been noticing and I've, I've started to get an opinion about is, you know, don't judge what you see or compare what you see online in the media. I think I saw on Facebook not too long ago a woman who was like, I think she was like eight months pregnant and she was doing like high intensity kickboxing, like roundhouse kicks, kicks, you know, um, high boxing. Like it was just, it was crazy to watch her. Um, The intensity and the velocity and the dynamic exercises that she was doing. And she had this massive tummy. Um, So she was quite far along. Um, and then the other one that I saw not too long ago was someone same thing. She had to be at least seven um, months pregnant and she was doing Olympic lifting and lifting this bar up and around her tummy to do Olympic lifts, um, which just, you know, that's not for everyday athlete. That's not for someone that, you know, is um, just getting into CrossFit or, yeah. you know, just starting up a training program. So just don't. Um, compare yourself to what you see on the media and same thing for afterwards. Every body is different um, and not going to heal the same. So, you know, what we see in the media of like, Oh, a woman went back and ran a marathon, you know, eight weeks after pregnancy or delivery, that's not common for everybody. So just, listen to your body and you know if you have any concerns seek guidance whether it be family doctor or physio that sort of thing so yeah yeah I never realized like how tough that would be until like some you know a lot of my friends are all like pretty similar in age and like started having kids at the same time and then yeah Mm -hmm. the how they can get back to stuff varies so wildly it's crazy and it all it also all depends on like I said one their fitness coming into it but also like the trauma of their birth, you know, um, right. So some, and it's all different. You can't say, Oh, well, my friend was really easy and you know, no damage. I'm going to be like that. You don't know what's going to happen. You can do some things to help. Um, but if you have a really traumatic birth and you push for two hours and or three hours, and then all of a sudden they decide to do a C-section, I mean, there's a lot of trauma to your pelvic floor or yeah. you deliver vaginally and you have massive amount of tearing. That's really going to affect the strength of your pelvic floor muscles. So you can't, can't compare yourself to one person to the other after childbirth. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, speaking of postpartum then, um, Mm -hmm. do you have any sort of rules, especially for, I'm thinking cycling, because I Mm -hmm. mean, you're putting a lot of, you know, like 
you just shot a human being out of there and now you're yeah, put it yeah. on a saddle. <laughs> yeah. So when can somebody get back to riding? And I mean, I know it varies wildly. So yeah. there's no like three weeks and you're fine. But are there any yeah. signs that a person can look for down there for like, okay, I think my lady parts are ready to go. Yeah. And again, it goes back to the trauma. So if you have a lot of stitching, I mean, most of the time women have like discomfort just sitting day to day. Yeah. Um, so I personally don't see women until six weeks postpartum for any sort of internal exam. And hopefully by then they're cleared as well. So if there was any other additional, you know, issues from their delivery that the doctor says you still can't go back to intercourse, you still can't have any internal, then we don't do any work. So my guideline is six weeks before any sort of internal stuff. But in terms of getting back onto the bike, again, it's going to be your own personal comfort. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I said, the beauty of cycling is it's low impact. So in terms of um, that sort of stress to your pelvic floor, it's low. So I would say like if you were, if you did have, um, if you didn't have any pain um, in the perineum, then, um, you know, I would just start back easy in terms of, you know, flat rides, not big hills that you're really pushing and muscling up mm-hmm. um, and, you know, lower uh, in uh, distances just to get back to it. Uh, again, it's all going to depend on the person's fitness leading into it as to where they're going to start. But, um, you know, it's going to be your own personal comfort because um, most of the time women are like, I don't want anything in that area. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Anyways especially if they've had some stitches um, or tearing. So um, it's, uh, and I actually, you know, I, I haven't personally come across any specific research um, for female cyclists postpartum. I haven't come across anything. Unfortunately with cycling, a, a lot of the research comes um, from the male population and that's totally. kind of, yeah, common in general. Um, but uh, I haven't specifically seen anything on females postpartum with cycling so yeah something I can always look into but I haven't seen anything just as I'm going through stuff so yeah no I've noticed the same thing it does seem like I'm seeing more research on female runners though which is making Mm -hmm. me pretty happy it feels like that's finally so we're we're getting there I think totally you know and there's actually this really in the last probably I mean there's always been research on athletes and female athletes but I'm gonna say in the last probably like five months I've really seen it come to the forefront and I think it's due to the the CrossFit phenomenon um and the popularity of that yeah and all the issues that you know um with jumping and the skipping and stuff like that it's um I feel like that's what's kind of spearheaded a lot of this research on female athletes it's it's been there because you know I was just looking in prep for this talk you know some of the research that was out and there's stuff back in like the early 2000s um from one of a pretty prominent uh researcher mm-hmm. Carrie Bow. so it's been out there I mean they look at it in terms of gymnasts and runners but um I feel like there's more there's courses I'm seeing on it now specifically like pelvic floor and the female athlete um so it's uh, it's coming. It's like there's more out there, which is great to see. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, all right, before I before I ask about the the guys side of this, we just yeah. talked about a ton of stuff. So if you were to maybe say your like two or three key points that like female athletes should know about pelvic floor health, what what yeah. are we looking for? Okay, so my number one thing is leaking, having incontinence is not normal. It's common. That's the misconception. People are like, oh, my friends do it. I had a baby. You know, it, it's, uh, it's part of womanhood. It's supposed to happen. It's not. <laughs> it's not normal. You're not supposed to. And um, all the commercials that make you think that it's normal and you can just wear a pad and nobody will know, you still know. And um, so that's, that's number one. You know, it's, it's common, but it's not normal. And that treatment is available. You don't have to go through that. That's the biggest thing I think is important for women to know. Mm-hmm. Um, number two, I would say is, you know, you can't assume that you're doing things correctly. You can't assume that you're doing Kegels properly or that Kegels are appropriate for you. You know, when we think of pelvic floor, we think of Kegels, but like I talked about with the the spectrum of tension and tone in the pelvic floor, doing Kegels isn't appropriate for everybody. So if you do have pain, if you do have numbness, if you do have, or you're struggling to be able to do them, maybe it's because your pelvic floor is actually tight. 
Right. In which case, heels aren't appropriate. Um, the example I give people is, you know, if you had neck tension and your like upper shoulders were really tight, and you know, someone told you, well, you should do fifty shrugs a day, like lifting weights, fifty shrugs. You'd be mm-hmm. like, well, that's crazy. It's just going to make it tighter, and that makes sense to people, but it doesn't make sense with our pelvic floors. So, you know, I think that's number one that kegels aren't, or number two, sorry, that. Kegels aren't appropriate for everybody, and you can't assume that you're doing them properly, um, and you might need some guidance on how to do that. Um, and then three, I guess, would be let's go let's go with the pregnancy round. You know, I think it is important to be proactive, mm-hmm. and that's something that I'm loving seeing, and I try to advocate to women in the area, my communities. Like, you can be proactive, and there's things that you can do to prevent um, or minimize the risk, I should say to, um, trauma to your pelvic floor and make your outcome better. Um, so if you have a better handle of how to engage your pelvic floor going into pregnancy, it's going to help you afterwards. Um, so, you know, a sense of, uh, being proactive is, is going to help you in the long run. Um, cause that's what we see It's when women start heading into, you know, either postpartum, they've had multiple children, or they're heading into menopause. That's the typical demographic um, that I see. So being proactive with your pelvic floor um, and preventing problems before they happen um, is the other kind of word of wisdom regarding pelvic floor physio. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Mm -hmm. And then my last question, because we've talked a lot about this, you know, idea of internal work and kegels and all that kind of stuff. But for the men out there, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's the deal with the male pelvic floor? (laughs) Yeah. So I personally don't treat men. It's just my own kind of comfort level and focus. I like working with women and Mm -hmm. their, their sort of issues. But I have worked with men in the past and been educated. And so, you know, the male population, um, we're not going to see prolapse. We're not going to see the same sort of um, pelvic floor damage as we do in women just by nature of not giving birth. <laughs> right. Um, but they can still have incontinence and they can still get pelvic pain. Um, they can still get irritations of the bladder and sort of some of these other um, systemic um, disorders that we see within pelvic floor physio. Um, and they still do internal work. Um, so it's just a different opening. <laughs> they go through the rectum and the anus. So it's just, it's a different treatment. Um, usually the population is going to be, um, you know, a common population, I should say, is post-prostatectomy. So if they've had prostate cancer and they've had the prostate removed, there can be damage to the urethra and to the pelvic floor and to some of the nerves. Um, so that's a really common um, population, um, as well as pelvic pain. So again, in terms of the athlete, you know, cyclist, um, that's again, like I said, where a lot of the research in terms of saddle compression comes from is in the male population. So like all the guys on the tour of the fronts and stuff like that, um, they probably have some sort of pelvic floor dysfunction in terms of numbness, pain, erectile dysfunction. Um, and, uh, again, it's from that compression of on the saddle. So, you know, talking about positioning, talking about saddle, um, styles, um, changing positions, stuff like that. Um, so that's the male population. Um, it's, uh, similar, you know, same exercises, slightly different cueing in terms of pelvic floor, um, and obviously different palpation with the, the treatment. So, um, that's sort of the, you know, in the a nutshell with the male population. But again, it's not something that I've treated a lot of. Um, but that, those are the sort of the demographics that I have seen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, I think that's that's all I have about pelvic floor. Is there anything okay. else that we didn't touch on that you desperately need the population to know? <laughs> um, I think I've gotten all the points across. I think, you know, the main thing is talk about it talk to your friends about it, you know, that's how the word spreads and that's how people get better. Mm -hmm. Um, And don't be afraid to look for information. Don't settle with symptoms that you think are bothersome or um, interfering with your life. Look stuff up. There's lots of new emerging information out on the internet. Um, Some good, some better than others. (laughs) Um, But, you know, most, um, most areas, have a pelvic floor physio most provinces have a pelvic floor physio um 
at your access. So it's just finding that out and talking about it and letting people know that there is treatment and there is help, um, that you don't have to kind of suffer through these symptoms. So, yeah. Awesome. All right. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. This was super thank you. helpful. Yeah, I love it. I love talking about this stuff. And I know we've had some good conversations. So it's always, it's always fun chatting with you about it. So Yay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. As always, thanks so much for tuning into this episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, please let us know what you thought about it, how it's impacted you or changed the way you're training. Uh, you can let us know in the comments over at consummateathlete.com. Or you could let us know over Twitter at Molly J. Herford and at Peter Glassford. And of course, if you liked the episode, please leave us a review over in iTunes. That would be super helpful. Uh, Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a great week and we will see you next time.